Morning all. Today's uh, league history entry is the 2003-2004 season, which was mired in controversy and the impending doom that was to come. We all knew. Uh, the, the fight between the NHLPA and the NHL was simple. The NHL saying, look, we're not making enough money to justify these contracts. And the NHLPA answering with, you guys are signing these contracts. You guys set the market value. So why do we need a salary cap? And so the fight was on. And we knew that the 0405 season may very well not happen. I still have the 0405 uh, annual, the, the yearbook uh, from the Hockey News, which it is mostly just, hey, so we're not going to have a season. Let's discuss uh, why we're not going to have a season. So it was weird. And the 0304 season felt important. And yet it was overshadowed with other things too. So we'll talk about that. But looking at the standings, Tampa Bay finishes first in the East. 106 points, record of 46, 22, 8, and 6. This is the last season we'll have four columns uh, when it comes to the win-loss records. Who knows, maybe at some point in time we'll have four columns again. Uh, the discussions people have of whether or not to go to a three-point system or go to a different system for measuring wins and losses and everything. And we could have a four-column four uh, set up again at some point. 245 goals for Tampa, 192 goals against. Their leading scorer, Marty San Luis, who was the leading scorer in the NHL. 82 games, 38 goals, 56 assists, 94 points. Oh, yeah. And uh, they're still not cracking down on the obstruction and all of the things that are making the hockey hard to watch. Boston finishes second, 104 points, record of 41, 19, 15, and 7. 209 goals scored, 188 goals against. Joe Thornton, their leading scorer. 77 games, 23 goals, 50 assists, 73 points. The Philadelphia Flyers, 40, 21, 15, and 6 record, 229 goals scored, 186 goals against, 101 points. Uh, Mark Recchi, 82 games, 26 goals, 49 assists, 75 points, the leading scorer in Philly. Toronto, 45, 24, 10, and 3 record, 103 points, 242 goals scored, 204 goals against. Matt Sundin. Their leading scorer, 81 games, 31 goals, 44 assists, 75 points. The Ottawa Senators finished 43, 23, 10, and 6, so 102 points. Uh, 262 goals scored, 189 goals against. Marion Hossa, Hossa being their leading scorer, 81 games, 36 goals, 46 assists, 82 points. Uh, the New Jersey Devils, 43, 25, 12, and 2 record, 100 points. 213 goals scored, 164 goals against. Uh, Eliash being their leading scorer, 82 games, 38 goals, 43 assists, 81 points. The Montreal Canadiens for, finished 41, 37, and 4, 93 points. 208 goals scored, 192 goals against. Mike Ribeiro, their leading scorer, 81 games, 20 goals, 45 assists, 65 points. The New York Islanders, they finish above the playoff line, 38, 29, 11, and 4 record. 237 goals scored, 210 goals against, 91 points. Trent Hunter is their leading scorer that year, 77 games, 25 goals, 26 assists, 51 points. The Buffalo Sabres miss the playoffs, record of 37, 34, 7, and 4, 85 points. 220 goals scored, 221 goals against. Uh, Danny Briere, the leading scorer, 82 games, 28 goals, 37 assists, 65 points. The Atlanta Thrashers, 33, 37, 8, and 4 record, 214 goals scored, 243 goals against, so 78 points. Ilya Kovalchuk, the leading scorer in Atlanta, uh, 81 games, 41 goals, 46 assists, 87 points. So the Thrashers, not a bad season by their standard, but again, 13 points outside of a playoff spot. They're not giving Atlanta fans a reason to go and actually watch games. Uh, Carolina, 28, 34, 14, and 6 record, so 76 points. 172 goals scored, 209 goals against. Vasicek being their leading scorer, 82 games, 19 goals, 26 assists, 45 points for their leading scorer. Uh, the Florida Panthers, 28, 35, 15, and 4 record, 75 points. Uh, 188 goals scored, 221 goals against. Ole Jokinen, their leading scorer, 82 games, 26 goals, 32 assists, 58 points. For the New York Rangers, another miserable season. And again, the salary cap saves the Rangers because it makes them spend their money wisely and not just the most of it. Uh, 27, 47, and 8 record, 69 points, 206 goals scored, 250 goals against. Bobby Holik, their leading scorer, 82 games, 25 goals, 31 assists, 56 points. 
The Washington Capitals finished 23, 46, 10, and 3. 59 points, 186 goals scored, 253 goals against. Robert Long ends up being the leading scorer combined between Detroit and Washington. Uh, 63 games, 29 goals, 45 assists, 74 points. So considering how little scoring is going on, that 74 points in 63 games isn't bad. Uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins bought him out. 23-47, 8-4 record, 58 points, 190 goals scored, 303 goals against. Dick Tarnstrom is their leading scorer. 80 games, 16 goals, 36 assists, 52 points. Both a remarkable season by Tarnstrom and, all, and also telling you what you need to know about the state of the Penguins when Tarnstrom is your leading scorer. No offense to him, but yeah, we had Lemieux, uh, Yager, we're going to have Crosby and Malkin. Yeah, Tarnstrom, it, it's, it's a little bit of a difference there. Then out west, uh, Detroit is the leading team, 109 points, record of 48, 21, 11, and 2, 255 goals scored. 189 goals against. Pavel Datsuk being their leading scorer. 75 games, 30 goals, 38 assists, 68 points. Patrick Marlowe and the Sharks finished second. Uh, Marlowe leading them in scoring. 28 goals, 29 assists, 57 points in 80 games. Uh, 43, 21, 12, and 6 record for the Sharks. So 104 points. 219 goals scored. 183 goals against. The Vancouver Canucks, they win their division that year. 101 points. Uh, but at what cost? 43, 24. 10 and 5 record, 235 goals scored, 194 goals against. Marcus Naslin, their leading scorer, 78 games, 35 goals, 49 assists, 84 points. The Colorado Avalanche, 40, 22, 13, and 7, 100 points, 236 goals scored, 198 goals against. Joe Sackick's their leading scorer because it's kind of how that works. 81 games, 33 goals, 54 assists, 87 points. Dallas, 41, 26, 13, and 2 record, 97 points. 194 goals scored, 175 goals against. Phil Guerin leading them in scoring that year, 82 games, 34 goals, 35 assists, 69 points. The Flames finished 42-37-3 that year, 94 points. 200 goals scored, 176 goals against. Jerome McGinley leads them in scoring, 81 games, 41 goals, 32 assists, 73 points. The St. Louis Blues, they're above the playoff line at 39-30-11-2 for 91 points. 191 goals scored, 198 goals against. Keith Kachuk, their leading scorer, 75 games, 33 goals, 38 assists for 71 points. The Nashville Predators make the playoffs, 38, 29, 11, and 4 record, 91 points, 216 goals scored, 217 goals against. Uh, Sean Walker <clears throat> being their leading scorer, no, not Sean Walker. Um, come on, come on, brain, come on, you can do this. Uh, but Walker and former Canuck, Scotty Walker, there it is, Scotty Walker, 75 games, 25 goals, 42 assists, 67 points. The brain fog wanted to take that name away from me, and I said, no, I will find it. It's in there somewhere. It's not Nathan Walker. It's not Sean Walker. It's not Larry Walker. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, the Oilers finished just below the playoff line with 89 points, a record of 36, 29, 12, and 5, 221 goals scored. 208 goals against. Ryan Smith, their leading scorer. 82 games, 23 goals, 36 assists, 59 points for Captain Canada. Uh, Minnesota, 30-29, 20-3 record. Uh, 83 points, 188 goals scored, 183 goals against. Alexander Dagg is their leading scorer that year. He has 78 games, 20 goals, 31 assists, 51 points. Luke Robitaille, the leading scorer for the Kings, just beneath them. Robitaille, 80 games, 22 goals, 29 assists, 51 points. The Kings, 28, 29, 16, and 9 record, 81 points, uh, 205 goals scored, 217 goals against. The Anaheim Ducks, 29, 35, 7, or 35, 10, and 8, as they're unable to get back into the playoffs after the 0-3 run. They finished with 76 points, 184 goals scored, 213 goals against. And they'd acquired Sergei Fedorov, too. The expectations were higher than this. 80 games, 31 goals, 34 assists. 465 points. Just beneath the Ducks, we have the uh, Phoenix Coyotes, 22, 36, 18, and 6 record, 68 points, 188 goals scored, 245 goals against. Shane Doan, the leading scorer for the Coyotes, uh, 79 games, 27 goals, 41 assists, 68 points. Columbus finishes with 62 points, record of 25, 45, 8, and 4, 177 goals scored, 238 goals against. Rick Nash, their leading scorer, 80 games, 41 goals, 16 assists for 57 points. And the Chicago Blackhawks round things out in the West with 59 points. 
Record of 20, 43, 11, and 8. 188 goals scored, 259 goals against. Tyler Arneson, their leading scorer, 82 games, 22 goals, 33 assists, 55 points. So I wanted to show the leading scorers for each team in this video to show you just how low scoring the National Hockey League is at this point and how that's also something the NHL wants to address amongst getting a salary cap and just basically changing how hockey works. Uh, September 26th of 2003... Uh, again, this was a dark season. This was not a happy season in the National Hockey League. Uh, Dan Snyder, uh, he dies in a car crash. The car was driven, of course, by Danny Heatley. Heatley is injured badly in the car accident, too. Uh, Heatley was charged, and ultimately Snyder's family uh, forgave uh, Heatley and felt that this was, this was a tragedy, but they, they did feel that it was an accident. There was excessive speed involved. And so it just, it casts a, a, a dark darkness over the Atlanta Thrashers season. Uh, Snyder was a young player. There was some debate about his upside and all of that. And it starts the wheels towards Danny Heatley leaving Atlanta as well. Uh, the LA Kings ended the season with an 11-game losing streak to miss the playoffs. So they missed the playoffs by 10 points. Well, an 11-game losing streak will guarantee that. I guess they wanted to get straight into the lockout. Uh, August 25th of 2003, the Penguins trade Johan Hedberg uh, to the Canucks for a 2004 second round pick, which they used to draft Alex Goligoski. Interesting. Uh, and November 16th of 2003, the Sharks trade Mika Kiprasov to the Flames for a 2005 second round pick that becomes Mark Edward Vlasic. So the Flames win that trade, sure, but at the time, Nabokov looks fantastic for San Jose, so there's no room there for Kiprasov. And this was an era where San Jose's just creating goaltenders, um, just, just seemingly spawning them const con constantly. Um, and so, yeah, they felt like Kiprasov was one that they could move, and they pick up a draft pick in return. It becomes a pretty good defenseman for San Jose. Uh, January 20, 23rd of 2004, the Caps trade Yerma Yager to the Rangers for Anson Carter. Doesn't work out necessarily all that well for the Capitals, but Yager's time in Washington was not great. And so it's a move the Caps feel like they have to make. Um, February 18th of 2004, the Capitals trade Peter Bondra to the Sens for Brooks Like and a 2005 second round draft pick. Which at the time I looked at and said, wow, the Sens are just fleecing them. Nope. Uh, Bondra never really hit in Ottawa and Like ends up being a pretty decent player in the NHL. Uh, March 3rd of 2004, the Rangers trade Brian Leach and a 2004 fourth round pick to the Leafs for uh, Kondratyev, Imanen, a 2004 first, and a 2005 second. A 2004 first became Chris Chaco, who, right? Uh, it was a Flames pick by the time he got it. So basically, the Leafs get Brian Leach, uh, who at this point is not the same Brian Leach that he was when he played for the Stanley Cup a decade earlier. But still, it doesn't feel like the Rangers necessarily get full value there. Uh, March the 8th of 2004 the Caps trade Anson Carter yeah they didn't keep him for that long he goes to LA Jared Allen going the other way so uh they turned Yermer Yager into Jared Allen and it only took a couple of months so it's a tough time for the Capitals and the Penguins at the same time because these teams seem to be tied together I don't know what it is um <clears throat> the the teams also switched to white jerseys on the road that year maybe that's what leads to the the just the absolute mess that follows but uh, that's where we get the switch from the home team wearing white to the home team wearing the dark colors. Uh, the Coyotes would move to Glendale uh, Arena in De on December 27th of 2003. That's nice. The Arizona Coyotes, then known as the Phoenix Coyotes, have themselves a new arena. This should solve the problems in Arizona. Does it? Uh, March 8th of 2004. Uh, it is the night of the infamous Bertuzzi incident on Steve Moore. I did a video on this not too long ago, and uh, there are still people who think that what happened to Steve Moore is somehow justifiable. It's not. Uh, Moore had injured uh, Marcus Nasland in a previous meeting between the two teams, which angered the Canucks greatly. Uh, there were some threats that were thrown out there directly to the media, like in media quotes. The NHL should have thrown out fines and suspensions, which they didn't. Um, they did kind of, you know, strongly worded email type of stuff, but nothing of, of value or actual concrete consequence. And so, uh, when that next meeting took place, Todd Bertuzzi sucker punches Steve Moore. Moore would never play again. Bertuzzi got charged over the incident as well. 
there was a big investigation. Bertuzzi gets suspended for what is essentially uh, over a year of hockey. But since the lockout is that year, basically what he's suspended from is all the international tournaments and being able to play overseas when other player other players do as well. Uh, Bertuzzi was blackballed. Then when the NHL comes back, they decide, well, we're going to allow him to return as well. But what that did too was it sped up the end of the West Coast Express era in Vancouver. It soured that core. It, it soured the feeling in Vancouver towards the team a little bit. And uh, it, just, it, it just wasn't pleasant. And what could have been a great rivalry between Vancouver and Colorado, which could have rivaled, I think, the Detroit-Colorado rivalry, um, is, is blunted by just how violent uh, the incident was in Vancouver that night. And just it's, it's not a great time. Uh, for National Hockey League fans, as we know we're staring down the barrel of a lockout and you have uh, a death before the season starts, and then you have this ugly, violent incident towards the end of the regular season. And then we get into the playoffs, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but your Art Ross winner that year is Marty St. Louis of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Masterton goes to Brian Berard of the Chicago Blackhawks, who played basically with one eye um, in his career after, after a, an eye injury during a game. Uh, the Calder goes to Andrew Raycroft of the Boston Bruins, who had himself quite the season. The Conn Smythe goes to Brad Richards of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Selkie Trophy goes to Chris Draper of the Detroit Red Wings. Best $1 they ever spent. Uh, the Hart Trophy goes to Marty San Louis of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Jack Adams goes to John Tortorella, also of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Norris Trophy goes to Scott Niedermeyer of the New Jersey Devils. The King Clancy Award goes to Jerome McGinley of the Calgary Flames. The Lady Bing goes to Brad Richards of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Lester Pearson Award goes to Marty San Louis of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Rocket Richard Trophy goes to three players, Jerome McGinley in Calgary, Rick Nash in Columbus, and Ilya Kovalchuk in Atlanta, who led the league with 41 goals. So again, the league has a problem with scoring, which will be addressed coming out of the lockout, but what a mess getting there. <clears throat> the Vesna Trophy goes to Marty Berder of New Jersey, and he also wins the Jennings Trophy, for lowest goals against. As a reminder, New Jersey allowed 164 goals in 82 games. Absolutely insane numbers from uh, most NHL teams, but especially New Jersey that year. Your All-Stars, uh, your first team All-Star at the, down the middle is Joe Sackick of the Avalanche. Matt Sundin of Toronto is the second team All-Star. On the left side, Marcus Nasland of Vancouver's first team All-Star. Ilya Kovalchuk of Atlanta's second team All-Star. On the right side, Marty San Louis of Tampa Bay's first team All-Star, Jerome McGinley of Calgary's second team. On the blue line, Scott Niedermeyer of New Jersey's first team, alongside Zdeno Chara of Ottawa. So that trade's already turned bad, turned out bad for the Islanders. Although they do make the playoffs, and Yashin had a couple of good years there. Uh, and then on the second team, on the blue line, Chris Pronger of St. Louis and Brian McCabe of Toronto, second team All-Stars. Uh, in that, Marty Berder of New Jersey's the first team All-Star, and Roberto Luongo of the Florida Panthers, second team all-star so looking at goalie stats i didn't feel like i had to do the top 10 scorers because i've got all these scorers right here so marty berder finishes atop the wins table for goaltenders 38 26 and 11 record 9 17 save percentage 11 shutouts uh, marty turcos 37 21 and 13 record 9 13 save percentage 9 shutouts uh, ed belfour of toronto 34 19 and 6 record 9 18 save percentage 10 shutouts uh, Thomas Vokun in Nashville, 34, 29, and 10 record, 909 uh, save percentage, three shutouts. Uh, Dan Cloutier in Vancouver, 33, 21, and six record, 914 save percentage, five shutouts. I, again, I will say, Cloutier was a good goaltender during regular season. Um, Jose Theodore in Montreal, 33, 28, and five record, strong, 919 save percentage, six shutouts. Uh, David Abisher in Colorado. Uh, the undeniable, uh, really, it's, it's not an enviable job replacing Patrick Waugh. Uh, and so he tries his best. 33 28 and 5 record for Abisher, 924 safe percentage and four shutouts. The numbers were strong for Abisher, just the playoff results weren't quite there for him because you're trying to follow Patrick Waugh. Somewhere Jocelyn Tebow goes, right? So we get to the playoffs. Colorado faces Dallas, a team that Dallas has beaten, but they don't beat him this time. Colorado wins four games to one. Calgary beats Vancouver four games to three. As the team's implosion really continues, uh, the San Jose Sharks beat St. Louis four games to one. Detroit beats Nashville four games to two. 
Uh, Toronto beats Ottawa four games to three because it's a bad matchup for the Sens. Uh, Philadelphia beats New Jersey four games to one, and Montreal beats Boston four games to three because it's a bad matchup for Boston. So I was pretty miserable those playoffs. Vancouver and Boston both losing in game sevens against hated rivals. Uh, Tampa Bay beats the Islanders four games to one. Oh, of course, Colorado knocking out Dallas didn't make me happy either. Uh, the conference semifinals, San Jose beats Colorado four games to two. Calgary beats Detroit four games to two, which put me in an odd position where I was actually cheering for Calgary, and it felt weird, and it was weird, and to this day, it's just odd. Um, Philadelphia beats Toronto four games to two, and Tampa Bay sweeps Montreal. So Montreal gets that upset win over Boston, and then Tampa Bay says thanks and sweeps them aside. Uh, the conference finals, it's Calgary and San Jose. Refreshing to see Calgary and San Jose. It was at the time because they hadn't won anything for a while. Uh, Calgary hadn't won a cup since 89, of course, and San Jose had never been to a final. Uh, Calgary wins the first game in San Jose 4-3 to in overtime. They then win 4-1 to in game two. Uh, San Jose then goes into Calgary and wins both games there. Scores of 3-0 and 4-2. to Calgary wins 3-0 in San Jose and then wins at home 3-1 to to win the series in six games. So Mika Kiprasov, revenge is uh, served best in a conference final. Uh, <clears throat> Tampa Bay plays Philadelphia in the other conference final, of course. Tampa Bay wins the first game 3-1. to uh, Philly wins the next game 6-2. to Tampa Bay then wins 4-1. to Philadelphia wins 3-2, to so they're back and forth. Tampa Bay wins at home 4-2 to to go up three games to two. Philadelphia ties the series with a 5-4 to overtime win. And then Tampa Bay wins game 7, 2-1 to to go to the Stanley Cup final against the Flames. Uh, Calgary beats Tampa Bay in that first game 4-1. to Tampa Bay answers with a 4-1 to win. Uh, in Calgary, the Flames win 3 nothing, So they go up two games to one. Feeling is good that maybe Calgary's going to win that Stanley Cup. Uh, Tampa Bay won, wins the next game, though, one nothing. Uh, Calgary wins 3-2 to in overtime in Game 5. And then Tampa Bay wins 3-2 to in double overtime in Game 6. Uh, Tampa Bay wins Game 7, 2-1. to Tampa Bay wins the Stanley Cup, uh, going the full seven games. And, of course, one of the, the dominant storylines of that Stanley Cup final is the the goal is not a goal, right? Where it looks like from the, the front-facing camera that that puck's in the net, but there was no definitive angle that showed the puck in the net. So you can't award a goal based on vibes or you think it might be in. And this is, I think, part of the reason why we have so many camera angles that we have now. Incidents like this underline the need for an overhead camera, underline the need for just various cameras to show whether or not the pucks cross the line but Tampa Bay does win the Stanley Cup final in seven games and to this day uh, there are Flames fans who feel like that was their Stanley Cup. So in that final again I had three goals and two assists. Chris Simon had two goals and an assist and Capri uh, Saprikin had a goal and two assists for the uh, Calgary, Calgary Flames. Kippers saw a 924 safe percentage in that final so he played well. On the other side, you had Richards with four goals and five assists on his way to the Conn Smythe. Uh, San Louis had four goals and two assists. And Ruslan uh, Fedotenko had three goals and an assist. Uh, Habi Bulin, 918 save percentage in that final. So tomorrow we will be talking about the lockout season. I'm not sure how I'm going to do the board for the lockout season. We'll see. Uh, but do let me know your thoughts regarding this season and your thoughts on the video in general. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.